So allow that open stream to stay present in your being as you open your eyes and come back to this moment together. So now we're going to look at um, these two divisions of the practice. So how to think about the guide and how to act towards the guide. And um, as we discuss these, um, I would ask you, again, if, if it feels meaningful to you, to take these teachings as you leave and to um, think about them and to go over them again in your own being and to consider if you can grow these ideas of how to think about and, and treat um, the guide and the guide in all the beings that you encounter. So um, before we talk about the positive way to uh, think about, we, st we always start with the mind because the mind is where things come from. So in this tradition, we always start with the mind. We always start with how, how you think, how you set your mind, and then how you set your mind, how you act will follow easily from that. So if you're having challenges in your actions, there's something that needs to be tweaked at the level of the mind. When the mind is aligned, the actions run easily, and how others act towards you will run easily. Okay, so if there's challenges in the outer world, it's because something internal is a little bit wonked out. So um, the harmful way for you to think about the guide, and therefore other beings, as well as yourself, are two the most harmful. One is that they're ordinary. And we've already talked about this, so I won't go into this in depth. But again, just to say, if you wish to receive the blessings of a high being, a divine being, an enlightened being, you must be participating in the view of working with a divine being. It's just simple, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Everyone clear on that? Yeah? I need everyone to be nodding or saying no, so I can say it again. No. Yes? OK. <laughs> so I mean, and of course, you know, I recognize this is like no easy thing to say. It's not like, great, so Buddha, you know, like create, create them instantly. The, of course, there's a process to this, which has to do with continuing to work on how you think about them and how you treat them. But that will then, it snowballs itself, OK? So you start with, you know, uh, you might have a little view like, well, this person is kind of different than ordinary. And like, if you can at least like have that little bit of the snow, you can start to roll that and make it a bigger and bigger snowball for yourself, okay? So when, if you want to enter into a more official relationship with a teacher or if you already are in one, um, and of course you can start with the teachers you have. If anyone's in some kind of training program, it doesn't have to be a sort of ye olde official spiritual teacher. Anyone who's teaching you is teacher, okay? Um, so you can start and say, okay, you know, like really check in with yourself. Do I have some sense that this person has something to offer me, is, has something, you know, out of the kind of humdrum in them? And, and try to sense, it's not so much about the thing, it's the sensation. It's that feeling of the presence. And to try to get sensitive to that and then figure out how you can keep placing yourself in that stream. It's the stream of that presence, OK? All the other qualities, all the, again, the outer actions will come from being in that stream. So uh, it's harmful to think that they're ordinary in the sense you could also say, like, they're just the same as you. They have all the same afflictions as you. They're, you know. Um, the second one, which is maybe even more um, harming, is to think that that person outside of you is going to do it for you, is going to do the work for you. That will not happen, ever. <laughs> so, you know, we do this thing all the time where we're like making someone else the superhero or hoping someone, I mean, there's, I think it's a, a, a deeply misunderstood and harmful relationship to certain religious traditions to think that there is going to be someone who's going to save us in the sense that we don't have any participation, but that someone outside is somehow going to swoop in and fix everything for you, okay? That, that's impossible, and that is not going to happen. You have to step into your own life and take responsibility. That is the first, it's, it, for those of us who have taken vows in this tradition, 
and I think in most spiritual traditions, the first vow ha is some relation to get a hold of your responsibility in your own life. You know, it's not uh, let your responsibility to go onto some teacher and hope that they're going to somehow magically come in and transform you. It's not going to work that way. Okay, of course, that would be nice. But if, if it worked that way and we had any belief in a God or someone like Jesus or someone like the Buddha, don't you think they would have done it? It's like, what, what do you think? Like God's waiting around like, well, when Vargas wears a different shirt, I'll save her, you know, or like, what are we thinking, you know? But, and, but yet we still kind of, but, but we still have this feeling like, you know, we think, well, my, my relationship will save me. You know, it's not just a person. I mean, we do it on, my job will save me, you know? If I get this car, somehow I'll be saved. I mean, to recognize we do it, if I eat this cookie, somehow I will be saved. For real, y'all. You know, <laughs> David's like, well, the cookie probably will save me. <laughs> No, I mean, it's one thing to like, you know, may, maybe we can go into the fantasy and sort of think, well, Jesus will appear and save me or the Buddha will appear and save me somehow. Maitreya will, you know, turn from a dog into a floating being and save me. But to recognize we're participating in this, like, I will be happy if I eat that cookie, then I will be happy, which is the equivalent if you extend that out to I will be saved, you see? So any time, again, I, I was in the beginning of the class, I was talking about like it should, should it? We, ha we really want to get so sensitive that we're aware of these subtler movements of our mind and to see how we're participating in these views that then create these larger entities in our life that really harm us, you know? And of course, there are people that help us. Of course there are. Of course there are teachers and guides and people, and your job might help you and your lover might help you. They might save you, but they're not on their own going to save you. If you have the experience of someone saving you, helping you. You know, I remember I went, um, I was in a car accident. I was driving on the 405 and it was raining and I spun out and I hit the median and I was facing oncoming traffic. And this man appeared out of nowhere. Like he was there. It was like the accident was over and he was there and he stopped the traffic and he was, you know, just in like t-shirts and shorts, <laughs> like stopped the traffic moved my car, you know, I was totally like, what is going on, you know, and he moved my car to the whole other side of the road and turned it around, and like, this whole thing happened, you know, and then he was like, are you okay, and I was like, yeah, I guess so, he was like, okay, I'll see you later, and then he got in his car and left, you know, so in one sense, he saved me, but where is that coming from, you see, it can't, it can't be that person out on their own, some condition in myself made it possible to see that and then to participate. I also could have been like, don't touch me, don't touch my car, like, you're weird, I don't know you. You know, I could have had all kinds of other relationships to him, you know. But in that moment, I had, for whatever reason, I had the grace, you know, that to me was an experience of grace. But even an experience of grace is coming from something that you've put into play in your own life to be able to have the mind to perceive it and participate in it while it's happening. And the way you participate in grace is you go, yes, that's, yeah, that's how you participate in grace. You just go, do it, it's happening, okay? But to, to have that kind of mind, you know, let alone like having something even more than that happen to you, that takes extraordinary moment to moment in your life trying to stay open with the person at work who's frustrating you, trying to keep that openness, to build that view moment to moment through your life so then it can rise in those, in those larger events, okay? So, but to put other people in the position or other things in the position of somehow miraculously on their own coming in and, and taking care of you will, will not serve you ultimately in your life, okay? So we need to look at all the ways in which we're passive. We need to look at all the ways in which we're lazy. We need to look at all the ways in which we make ourselves servile to other beings. We make ourselves a servant, not, not in a positive way, okay, to other beings or we, we put ourselves in some kind of victim position and think like, you know, well, you know, I'll, I'll be happy if you love me in this way. You know, we do this often in our relationships. Like, I'll be happy if, you know, you're not making me happy, and if you would just love me this way, I would be happy. That's the voice of a victim, you know, and that's a very sad position to be in. So to figure out, um, so maybe before we go on, let's just... Um, 
you probably already have some ideas, but let's just close our eyes for a moment and um, just ask ourselves the question, where in our lives are we not taking responsibility for our own spiritual growth, our own transformation? Where are we passive? Where are we lazy? I'm not asking you to judge yourself. I'm not asking you to, to have some hard view of yourself right now. This is not about that. This is about a positive action of taking responsibility and just noticing. Noticing how it is that you're relating to your own world here. So just let your mind sort of roam around your life here for a moment. You already know, you know. And then uh, take a moment and just write, write down, it might be one thing or you might have a whole list of things, but write a few things down for yourself so you can start to attend to those areas for yourself. So um, we won't do this now because of time. We started a bit late, but um, I would just you can write underneath, um, and you can go and do this in your own time. Um, what are my reasons for this? And how does this work and not work for me, and why? So, you know, it might seem like in the moment it works to blame someone or it works to um, whatever your thing might be. So you might want to look at that. You know, how, how, do, how does it maybe a quick fix? Does it actually fix anything for you? Does it save you? And, uh, but ultimately, how is it not working for you and why? And then also to write down the question, um, what might I do to shift this? So I'd encourage you in your own time to, to just look into these questions. And I want to be very clear that this is not um, about berating yourself or thinking I'm such a loser because I'm not responsible for, in these ways in my life or, you know, I'm, I'm always blaming people. I'm such a big loser. But to, to try to be compassionate and to look at that part of yourself and like you would with a child who's acting out, to try to discern, you know, what are, what, are the, what are your reasons for this? I mean, you, you must have good reasons or you wouldn't be doing it. Um, but those reasons are related to a self who, who is holding on to a certain view that is harming you. So if you can start to relate to that view, to see what view is this self holding, then you might start to introduce another point of view and say, well, what if we worked from this point of view? And that's a process. It's a process. To say, okay, you know, let, let's try looking from this point of view. Uh, no, I don't want to. You know, and yourself might, that habit might be very strong. But you, this is the practice. This is why we have a practice. You know, it's, it's very, very rare, not impossible, but it's really rare that you might come to one teaching and become, be done. It's possible, but it's rare. Um, and in a way, it wouldn't be as much fun. <laughs> Because actually this spiritual practice is extremely fun. Um, once you get a sense of how it's moving, once you get a sense of what we call the upward spiral and you really see your life transforming, a lot of pleasure comes even from working with the most challenging things. You know, again, I'm not saying you might not have sorrow or a lot of anger or frustration come up, but within that it will be infused with a sense of, I have hold of my life. 
and I'm moving my life in the right direction. And that gives you a kind of peace and confidence. Um, so the, um, the, the first way to think about the teacher we've already talked about quite a bit. So I'll just review, is that they're an enlightened being. The guide is an enlightened being. And we've talked about all these reasons why. It's practical for you, etc. cetera. This, um, I think in your outline, you have cleansing faith. So this is the traditional term for this, which I think is very beautiful. So it's, um, it's a type of faith. So I might be working with a certain person in my life, and I perceive them as being special. But if I'm really honest with myself, I'm not <clears throat> full on seeing an enlightened being all the time. I'm seeing a person who has afflictions. I'm seeing a person who has challenges. And I know that I'm seeing that because I have those in myself. OK? <clears throat> but, I'm, but I'm having some kind of faith. I'm trying to work with the idea that this is, this is an awakened being who has unconditional love for me. And everything that they're doing for me is, a, is guiding me. So I am unable to see the anger in myself unless I see it rise in them. And when they show it to me, I'm able to identify it in myself and work on it. And that's a kindness that they're giving me. This is a view, you see? This is a view, a way of working. So this is a type of faith to say, I'm not seeing you as a Buddha 24-7, but I have faith that you are. And that faith cleanses you of your ordinary view of things. It cleanses you of the view that everyone's just like me, pretty freaking afflicted going through their day, just trying to hack it out, thinking about themselves pr pretty much most of the time, and once every like 17 hours has a consideration of someone else. You know, I'm trying to see, no, this is a person who actually, they're, they're free of their self. And they have an unlimited stream of attention for me, and they're helping me all the time. And that, you, you see, so if I can hold that view, it cleanses me of this other view that harms me. So this is a cleansing faith. This is, there are many types of faith in the Buddhist tradition in particular, and, uh, but this is the one we start with. And then from the cleansing faith, we work on to different types of faith. Um, you know the word guru? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the word guru. It's a Sanskrit word. Um, it, it is related and com comes from the same root as the word guya in Sanskrit, and guya means secret or hidden. So a guru, a teacher, a guide, is someone who has something about them that's mysterious, that's secret, that's hidden from you. They have qualities that are, are as yet hidden. They have a guya, part of them. They're a guru. Okay? It's, it's a beautiful word, I think, a guya. Guya, the secret. So you can think when you're with that person, like, you've got some secret virtue I'm not seeing yet. You know, like, I'm just not able to see how you're working for me, but I'm really trying. You know? and, and to do that in particular for the people you have great challenges with. Um, when you take a teacher or when you decide to work with some, someone with, like a teacher, it's basically like you take this person and you draw a circle around them. And you say, OK, everything I have focused this being in a certain way, now everything they do is a particular guidance for me. I, I'm going to try. I'm going to start with this one person. And I'm going to say, you are a focusing lens for positive meaning in my life. And as you get really good at that, then you can say, OK, you two people are a focusing lens for positive meaning. And then, okay, you three. And it's, again, it snowballs very quickly, you know, and then it's like the whole room, my whole city, everyone at my work, and eventually the whole universe, you, you can feel, has that unbroken stream of attention and love guiding you, okay? And, and then, then you're there, <laughs> right? Then, then you're with them, because then eventually, if you've drawn the circle around everything, if eventually you're going to have to draw it around yourself as well. <laughs> right? It's like you and you and you and you and <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know? and, then, and then you're in the union with the divine. All right? So this, this, is how we, you know, this is how we think about the teacher. This is the practice of thinking about the teacher. So the way you do that, again, I'll just repeat myself. Go into your meditation, sit down with that guide, whatever the image of, whatever guide you're working with, and try to perceive those qualities and try to sense those qualities. And then be sensitive as you move through your day. Of course, if you're working with a, an actual guide, when you're with the guide, try to perceive those qualities. Um, Sometimes we do this thing where we sort of have our teacher in our meditation, then we get in front of our actual teacher, and we're like, oh, and then there's you. 
you know, who's like teaching me the Dharma and, you know, changing your, their whole life to like come and do this thing with me. And we sort of like space out about that. But we're like, the teacher in my meditation is so wonderful, you know. So the point of having the teacher in your meditation is that you start to perceive that being outside of you, you know. Um, so then as you go through your day, try to sense how that presence is like winking at you. You know, as you go through your work with your family, with the people on the highway, you know, try to feel that. And as you do, you know, say, yes, this is it. Yes, this is it. Okay. So the next part is how to treat the teacher. So if, so we could say it this simply. If you are thinking of the teacher as a divine awakened being, a being who has unconditional love for you and is serving you on every level in every millisecond of the day, what would be the proper response? How would you act towards that being? You just ask yourself that. It's a, it's a slightly rhetorical question and that we're not going to answer it right now. How would you treat that being? That's all. You know, I don't, probably don't even need to go through the traditional teachings. How do you treat someone like that? Of course, you know, of course you would treat them with gratitude and with reverence and with kindness and with love back. You, you would, you know, you would make offerings to them. You know, if you, re if you really get down with this, if you can really enter the stream of this thought, you, you would be overwhelmed with love every time you were with this being because you would recognize what they're, what they're doing for you, how they are with you, you know. Um, there's um, the harmful way, the most harmful way to treat a teacher, a guide, to act towards a guide, uh, and therefore, again, to all other beings, including yourself is that, uh, and I mentioned this before, is that you act like it's a business deal. And it's really hard for us not to do this because almost everything in our society is a business deal. And we think, and we, we do it with our lovers, we do it with our family, we do it with our friends, you know. And, it, and if you think you don't, it's like just see what happens to your mind when your friend or your lover or your mother, whoever it is, pisses you off. And watch the stream that goes in your mind of like, you know, I washed the dishes last night, and I took the dog out, and I did this, and I did that, and like all these justifications, right? And that's just proof you're playing the game of a business. You don't, you're, you're not in a, in a space of love with that person. You're in a business deal with that person. If you're in love with that person, then you don't need anything back from them. You're just there to offer them. That, that's the presence of the guide. They don't need anything from you. They don't need you to like them. They don't need you to show up to class. They don't need you, you know, not to show up. They, they don't need anything. They don't need your money. They don't need your time. They don't need your praises. They need nothing. They are simply there. They will be there like Maitreya in the cave. They will be there whether you see them or not. They will be there whether you talk to them or not, etc. Okay, so how, how do you hold that? That's an extraordinary vision of a way to be with people. And, and, and I find very moving, and I would, I would love to be able to offer that and to receive that from, from, you know, I would like to be able to offer it to more and more people, and I would be able to receive it from more and more people. So when I see that business deal stream come up in my mind, I really have to go like, oh, so this is this thing. This is what I do. And then, you know, I think I've been participating purely with someone, but actually I've been cataloging all my actions so that I have a long list to show to them when they piss me off of all these wonderful things that I've been doing for them, you know? <laughs> and people are nodding because, you know, I'm seeing it because I know I do it in my mind, you know, or we, we have this. So uh, a business deal, another way to think of the guide, though another way it's not a business deal, is if you're in a business deal, a business person wants your business all the time. They, they want to keep you there, right? A, a guide does not want to keep you where you are. A guide wants you to transform. A guide wants you to actually get to the place where you, where you say, I don't, I don't need you, I'm enlightened. <laughs> you know, and then you can really start to relate, actually. You know, then, then you can really have a relationship where, where you're no longer being like, will you be my mom? Will you be my dad? Will you be my psychotherapist? Will you be my whatever? Will you like me? Will you not like me? All these games that we play, we throw them all against the guide. And the, again, if you're working with a, a good guide, they will be so transparent that you're not seeing them. You'll just recognize that you're seeing yourself. And then you can do something. You know, then you can start to work. And the, sometimes it happens that you see it on them. That happens sometimes. 
And then we think, oh, oh, my guide gets angry. My guide's a big loser. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's in your benefit. Who, who, why are they showing that to you, you know? Um, and often in my experience, there's something provocative in the presence of the teacher that, like, it all comes up. The pride, the frustration, the whatever it is, you know, all sort of rises. And then I can see it, you know? So we also have some kind of fantasy, like, you'll start to work with a spiritual teacher. We may have a fantasy that you start to work with a spiritual teacher and, like, you're just like, yeah, woo -hoo. Like, everything's like that all the time. I don't think that would be a very effective teacher, you know, unless you were already that. You know, if you were already in bliss all the time, fine. You don't need a teacher. Then you're just relating as two divine beings, and that's the goal anyway. So great. You're both already there, you know. But we also want to skip there without actually, again, doing the work of, of purifying ourselves of all these mental afflictions that we have, okay? And that's the practice and the guide will be there. So they don't want your returning business. They don't want your returning afflictions, you know? It's, uh, we don't charge for classes here, and there's a reason for that, because this isn't a business deal. There's no business being done here. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't need you to buy anything from me. That's not where we're relating, okay? And, uh, I know I do all kinds of service for my teacher, and I watch the business deal come up. You know, I think, well, I've done all these things for you, so are you gonna are you gonna stay in Australia the whole year, or like are you gonna come to America? You know, like so you can watch all those things. It's just um, it's all our misperceptions. So there's a this Zen story, um, and there's a student and a teacher, and the student is there, and, and he says, okay, if I do everything you say. Just as you say it, how long will it take me to get enlightened? And the Zen teacher looks at him and he goes, 10 years. He goes, okay, all right, 10 years. If I study twice as hard, if I don't eat and I just do my studies and I go into retreat more, how long will it take me? The teacher looks at me and goes, 20 years. <laughs> Students like, Okay, how about if I study tri tri triply hard, I don't talk to anyone at all, I, I memorize all the texts, I learn Sanskrit, I learn Tibetan, you know, when he goes through this whole list, and the teacher looks at him and he's like, 50 years. And so the student's like, okay, you're not making any sense. So I'm saying I'm going to work harder, and you're telling me it's going to take longer. Um, why are you saying that? And the teacher looks at him and he says, well, the more time you're spending thinking about the goal, the less time you will have for your practice, and therefore the longer it will take you. It's very interesting. You know, so this idea of like when we're just focused on the business deal. If I do this, will I get this? And how long will it take me? We're going to miss the actual practice, and we're going to dig ourselves a hole deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? And so, you know, to recognize we all do this when we sit down in our, if, you're, if you have a meditation practice, chances are that you've done this. You sit down and you're like, I'm going to get this out of this meditation. Bam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some peace. Here I go. It's going to happen. No, and then it's like, you're not, you, there's no practice going on there. You're just thinking about the goal. And you're missing the exquisite details of being in relation, the, the relationship with the guide and the relationship with wisdom and the relationship with divinity is a relationship, it's a relational practice. We are interdependent. When we participate in a business deal, it's us who's independent, and we're relating with someone else in order to use them to get where we need to go. That's suffering, that is called samsara, that is called the suffering realm. When we recognize that we are interdependent, we can start to just be in relationship with things and relationship with people. I don't need you to make me feel better, I don't need you to make me feel worse. I don't need you to do this for me or that for me. What is happening right now between us? That's what I need. And how do I want to relate to what is happening? I would like to relate in that you are in love with me and I am in love with you. Not a sexual, not a, I'm not talking about psychological love, right? I'm talking about real love. Love, love that transcends the self again and transcends time. So, um, 
this would be the very harmful way to treat your relationship to the teacher and therefore your relationship to other beings. So it's really hard in this consumer capitalist society, but to try to meditate and think about what it would be to relate to other people where there's nothing to be bought and there's nothing to sell. You're not trying to sell anyone anything, even about yourself, right? It's like, it's so interesting when, when you meet people for the first time, I, I sense this. I, I see what they're trying to sell me. You know, maybe they're trying to sell me that they're beautiful, or they're trying to sell me that they're smart, or they're trying to sell me that they're a good spiritual practitioner, or they're, they're all trying to sell me something, you know? I don't want to buy any of that. I don't need to buy any of that. <laughs> I have enough stuff. <laughs> I have enough self already, you know? I don't need anybody else's stuff, self to, to be sold. There's a, a, a great line, I'll, I'll play it at some point in the class, I'm sure. There's a, um, uh, what is his name, Brian? Joe Pub? Joe Pug, Joe Pug. Uh, it's, called, it's called Him 101, and he says, um, the, the, more I, the more I buy, the more I'm bought. And the more I'm bought, the less I cost. So the more I buy, the more I'm, I'm being bought. And the more I'm bought, the less my worth is, the less I cost, right? So to try to remove ourselves from all these business deals, and, and of course, just to come into awareness of what they are. Um, the, um, there's this great, great song from uh, Man of La Mancha, for me, a total artisan emanation, the musical Man of La Mancha. And um, don't laugh, it's true. <laughs> There is a be so many beautiful teachings on Guru Yoga in there. And uh, there's this song that Sancho Panza sings. He's the, for those of you that don't know, Sancho Panza is sort of the sidekick of Don Quixote. And Don Quixote is this like, you know, divine, crazy being. And, uh, and this other, um, who will become a student of Don Quixote's, but he, she's not yet. And she's really suspicious of him, as we often are in the beginning of our teachers, because they're sort of so other than us. And so we get suspicious of that. Um, and she comes to Sancho Panza and she's like, what is the deal? Why are you hanging around with this guy? First of all, he has no money. He's like totally crazy. He's, you know, running into windmills. Like, what is going on? And Sancho Panza is like, takes this long time to think and he goes, I like him. <laughs> That's the totality of it. And then he pauses for a little while and he goes, I really like him. And he, he goes through this whole thing. He's like, you could tear my fingernails out. You could pluck my pubic hair out one by one. But I really like him. I just sort of want to hang out with him. You know? And, and that's, that's the feeling of, of working with a guide. It's just sort of like, I don't care what I do with the guide. It doesn't matter. You know, they, we have, again, all these ideas like they should do this, they should teach me, or you know, I should come and learn a class. And, but if, you, if it comes right down to it, if you're in the stream of the real communication, you don't need to go to a movie together. You don't need to have dinner. You don't need to have a Dharma teaching. Or you could do all those things. You just like the person. And so again, to touch base where you have that with people in your life, those are guides for you. That energy, that's a pure energy of, of being able to be with someone just because you like them. And you know, all of you know, because I know you all have a relationship like that at some point in your life, or maybe you have many of them. Then what you do becomes this play, right? Because there's nothing you have to do together. It's not a business deal. You're not trying to seal something, make something happen. You know, time is money. It's just like, I don't know. Should we go out to dinner? Should we go see a movie? Should we paint our faces blue? Should we roll around the grass? What should we do? You know? Should we build an empire? It's like, it just happens. Then it happens, right? So you just like them. And then at one point she asks you, yeah, she asks him, what are you getting out of this? And he goes, you know, well, I, I've, I've been with Don Quixote for a long time, and already I, I've gotten um, nothing. <laughs> I've gotten nothing. <laughs> and that again, you know, that again is such a great teaching. It's like, if you're in the right relationship with the guide, you will increasingly be getting more and more nothing, in that yourself will be getting less and less and less. Yourself will be dropping more and more away, you know, so that's the right, you know, what, what is your teacher giving you? Nothing. Thankfully, nothing, right? They're not trying to sell me something. They're not trying to build myself up. In fact, they're desperately trying to take it away, <laughs> you know, trying to separate it. 
So um, here are the, uh, the helpful ways to, to treat your guide, to act towards your guide. And these are, again, these are in your outline. These are in order, um, in order of the power of them, in order of the um, meaningfulness of them. So the first is that you would give your, your guide um, gifts, material gifts of some kind. And um, w when you do that, it, it lessens your own attachment to the things. Again, it's not because your guide needs anything from you. Okay? It's, it's a practice for yourself. And, and if you can get underneath the idea of even having it as a practice, to again just recognize when you love someone, when you're in that easy stream, when, when you just like someone, of course you give them things. You want to give them things, you know, you want to make things beautiful for them, you want to dress nicely for them, all, you know, all those kinds of things. So to try to touch base with where that's happening in your life and, you know, to increase that. Um, and to make sure that as you're giving an offering, you know, to try, we try. As you're giving the offering, doing the dishes, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, to think, I don't need anything back from this. And then you're growing the view of the teacher in yourself. I don't need anything from this. I'm happy just to do it, okay? Um, the second one is that we offer service. And um, this, this allows you to enter the stream of the goodness that your guide is in. So the opportunity to do service, it's, it's like you become an arm, an, another arm or another eye or another mouthpiece of the guide. And um, I think, you know, there are many ways to do service and of course, a good way to do service is just to ask, what can I do for you? And um, sometimes we don't do that because we're afraid what will come back. <laughs> I, had, I had this recently. I had this a sort of wind of this recently. There's a, a teacher that I've just come in contact with that I'm, I'm really hoping to be able to, to communicate with more. And, and I had this first conversation with her. And... Um, and at the end of the conversation, you know, I said, please know, I, I, I'll, please know if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. And, um, and I felt this little wind like, uh-oh. You know, this little wind of like, I already have a lot of service that I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and that, that little wind, that's the business deal. Like, that's the part of yourself that thinks, like, I can't handle things. Like, you know, can't, can't she just help me? Like, do I have to help her? You know, and to watch the mind that sort of comes from that. But to know that if you're in the, again, if you're in the stream, if you're in the flow of that presence of the guide, one, you will never not have the energy to do what you need to do. You will never actually be overwhelmed. When we feel overwhelmed, it's because we're in the tightness of the self. The self gets overwhelmed very quickly because the self has a lot to do. It has a lot going on. It has a lot of issues it has to work out. And so it doesn't have time to do a lot of things. But the guy doesn't have anything to do, <laughs> doesn't have any self to worry about. So therefore, they can do everything. They, they have endless energy, right? And you might have had experiences of this in your life when you touch base with a kind of selfless service. It's like, you know, you'll forget to eat. You'll forget to do all kinds of things. And it's, it's not like, I haven't eaten all day. You know, it just, it just is goes, right? So there's extraordinary energy and power in all of us. We just block it. We, we have blocks around it. Um, so it's helpful for us to serve, to sort of try to start to enter that, that stream. Um, and again, you know, with all beings, you should just be walking around going, how can I serve you? What can I do, do for you? That, that would be being able to relate to all beings as the guide. Um, and lastly, uh, the highest, the most meaningful offering, the best way you could act towards the guide is to practice what they are teaching you to actually do what they're asking you to do. And um, this is sometimes very easy and sometimes very challenging. Sometimes the teachings are very explicit. Meditate. Meditate every day. You know, so if, if, you're, t if you're taking a teacher and your teacher has asked you to do that and you're not doing that, why? What is your resistance to that, you know? Are you, are you trying to make yourself appear? You know, what, what are you doing? And, uh, and then sometimes they're much subtler. You know, sometimes I've had many times with my teacher where I've said, What's, what should I do? And the answer appears very cryptic, which just means I can't hear it yet, you know. 
or he just won't say anything at all, or he just won't answer my question, or he just won't email me back, or I just won't hear from him for a month, or so on and so forth. There's all kinds of variations, right? So then I have to think, okay, there, I'm being asked to take this on myself. I'm being asked to look at this in myself somehow. And uh, so then I have to discern, what is the teaching here? What, what is the guide asking me? And, and then I have to try to have confidence and belief. And if you have real belief that you're going in the right direction, if you're going in that stream of all that we've talked about today, that you are doing the right action. You are doing the right practice. And sometimes there's like practices that someone has given you or someone has taught you to do something a certain way. And you discover a way that is more meaningful and more vital and more alive, actually. And then you must do that. You know that, again, the Maitreya will appear when the Buddha's teachings have disappeared. When there is some other outer practice that you're doing, you're still not there. But when you, when you are the practice yourself, you're there. And of course, you cannot rush that. You can't force it. You can't say like, oh, I am the, I'm the practice. I'm, I'm the practice. You know? <laughs> There's no self that's saying, I'm the practice, if you're the practice. You're just living your life then. And your life is flowing and is easy, okay? So you got to be honest with yourself in there. Um, so uh, just before we end, I want to say I sort of um, passed over the kindnesses, and um, which is the second part of how to think about the teacher. Um, but you can read them. They're, they're pretty direct. And um, it's just to, you know, the second part of learning how to think about the teacher is to think about all of the kindnesses that they've given you and to develop respect for, for that, respect for them. And uh, the word respect is a very beautiful word. It, um, it comes from a root which means to look back at. So someone we respect is someone that we don't just take on face value and pass over like we do most people. Someone we respect is someone we stay with and go into through time. And, and we have the um, honorable way of relating with them in, in that we, we wait with them for them to show us more qualities. This is the way you would want to be with the teacher. Okay? Um, so in your meditation, you can just sit down and think about, well, what are all the kindnesses? Think about all the kindnesses that people are giving you in your life. Say, you know, this is, this is the guide. And uh, that's a, a meaningful meditation. Um, so I want to tell you one last little story and show you these images. I think it's dark enough now, and then we'll... Um, We'll rest unless anyone has any questions. Um, actually, I want to do three last things. Are, are you guys okay? We started a half hour later. Are you okay if we go like 10 more minutes? If anyone really has to leave, you know, I, I love you and thank you for coming and go if you need to go. Um, so uh, some of you have heard me tell this story um, and I'm going to tell it again. And some of you probably have not. Um, this is from the, the Sword in the Stone, which is a, a book about King Arthur. Of the young King Arthur, and um, there's he's working with Merlin. You all know about King Arthur and Merlin, right? Everyone's like heard this at some point, right? Good, yeah. So Merlin's a wizard, a major wizard, full on, you know, like you could say full on enlightened being. The the guy's like 300 years old or something, and you know he can change all things to all kinds of things, and changes himself into serpents and dragons and all kinds of things. So. Um, the way he works with the young Arthur, and it's a beautiful story, won't go into the whole long thing, but Arthur like seeks him out. He goes to this great journey into the forest and he finds Merlin, he finds his teacher. He knows he needs a teacher, it's so interesting. And he goes and he finds his teacher and he brings Merlin back, and of course Merlin is his teacher. And Merlin's sort of like, oh, you're here, you're my student. Well, okay, I guess I'll move to the castle and teach you for as long as I need to teach you, and he leaves his house and like comes with him. And, um, and the way he's portrayed in the book is sort of like half magical and amazing and half like this old fuddy-duddy. And um, the way he starts to teach young Arthur is that he um, turns him into things. So he doesn't tell him about fish or birds or kindness. He, he turns him into a fish and he lets him go swim around as a fish. And then he turns him into a hawk and he lets him live with the hawks for a while. And, then, and so he learns all of these things. And in Buddhism, we'll get to this maybe a year from now in the long room. 
but there's a practice called exchanging self for others, where you, you don't think about the other, but you try to really take on the body of the other being and see the world from their point of view. This is a deep, deep compassion. So Merlin is offering him this practice and, and empowering him to have this practice to become a fish and a hawk and etc. And, and Arthur is having these amazing realizations and his life is changing and he's transforming. And meanwhile, the other student, uh, whose name is Kay, uh, is, Merlin's not changing him into anything. And, and Kay is like kind of bored with Merlin and you know, Merlin is not this amazing teacher for Kay like he is for Arthur. But he's still Kay's teacher. And, uh, and so one day Ar Arthur wakes up and he sees Kay and Kay's like really kind of depressed. And Kay doesn't really know the magical, the full, full on magic that is happening to Arthur because of course it's impossible to really communicate that type of magic. But he senses that Arthur is having these sort of other experiences that he's not having. And he's frustrated and he feels lesser and he feels like Merlin doesn't love him as much, et cetera, all these dramas that we go into. And my teacher doesn't love me, et cetera. And uh, so Arthur goes to Merlin and he's a very compassionate young man and he says, Merlin, Kay is really upset and you have to turn him into something. Like you can't just do this for me. This really isn't fair. And what's so great is, is first off, Merlin looks him right in the eye and he says, it's not fair, which is its own teaching, like right there. You know, he doesn't say, I will do it or I won't do it. He just says, that's the case. It's not fair. And Arthur's like, so you're going to turn him into something, right? Like you're going to rectify him. And, and Merlin, eventually they have this conversation and eventually he just says, I can't. I can't do it. And Arthur's like, I, what are you talking about? You're a big magician. Of course, you can, you can do it. And he says, no, I can't do it. And I don't know why I can't do it, which is very sort of beautiful. You know, he's, he says, I, I can do it with you, which is essentially saying, you're doing it. I don't know why I can do it with you. I can turn you into things. I can't turn Kay into anything because Kay doesn't have that view of me. You have, you have a view of me that allows me to turn you into things. And Kay has a view of me of a boring old guy a boring old man. And so that's the only way I can relate to him. And I don't know why that's the case. That's something that's far beyond, you know, beyond either of us. And um, so, you know, to, to realize this, um, this space that your relationship with your guide is totally intimate to you and you can't judge your practice versus anyone else's practice or how it's unfolding for you. And, and it's, that's very hard for us because we want to kind of look and be like, well, she's doing that and he's doing that and so I should be doing that and this is the way it should be done, right? Like this is the way it goes. But no one's path is ultimately like anyone else's path and no one will be taught in the same way, no one will have the same realizations at the same time and et cetera, et cetera. And as I said before, we can't choose that. We can't choose what we're gonna be taught when. We can't demand those things from our teacher and sometimes we do that. You know, we say, I, 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 we do this business deal thing. It's like, I've done these meditations. I've done my practice. This should happen. The teacher doesn't have that kind of power. And they, and they won't be able to tell you why either, you know, in that kind of direct way. So the, for better or for worse, with your guide, you are locked in a mystery together, which can either open your heart and make your life very extraordinary or make your life very frustrating. <laughs> Depends on how you want to view it but the two of you are, are locked together in, in a mystery. Um, the other way you can think of is this. The practice is not about your teacher making you something different than you are. Your teacher is there to illuminate what you already are. Arthur, as a being, already had, was already ripe and compassionate enough to have the experience of exchanging himself with others. All Merlin had to do was say, yes, was just to reflect it and say, I see it, you're a fish. And Arthur was a fish because he already had that in himself, you see? Kay didn't have that. He had other things. And so for Kay, Merlin would say, you're a great knight. And he was a great knight and he became a great knight, okay? So our teacher is actually not there to improve us, to change us, 
to make us a better person in the way we think our teacher is there to do. Our teacher is just there to reflect what we're ready for. And if we're able to step in moment to moment to our full capability, we ourselves grow ourselves naturally. So they're just witnessing a natural process. The teacher is just witnessing a natural process. Okay? Um, just as you are working, just as you are right now, is exactly right. And to mistrust that is to mistrust the divine somehow. We, again, the teacher has to start from the start of class, the teacher has that long vision. So they're saying where you are right now is perfect. And we're going like, no, I shouldn't be here, I should be there. Where you are is perfect in your journey, okay? Not to say that you don't do anything. You do what you have to do, whatever that might be. All right. Um, so we'll just look at this, Im these images and then do one last short meditation and finish up if we can see them. Can everyone see over here? If you can't, just move on over. Um, these are on the Ustream, so if people are interested, they can download these or Jed can send them to you. Um, these are just four ways, again, to look at... Um, so this is a Mongolian shaman. Um, and again, I encourage you to get closer if you feel like you can't see, but it's a little hard in this um, to be distant. You okay? So this sense of the transcendent, you know, and I don't expect you to have the same experience as me, but when I look at this being... multi-dimensional presence and I can uh, sense that this is a being who can communicate with other realms. This is a sort of taste, a uh, flicker of that transcendent teacher that we were talking about before. And sometimes this quality in people frightens us. We feel ourselves back away from it. We have a lot of fear about the unknown. We have a lot of fear about um, spaces and realms that take us out of our ordinary sense of control. But it's uh, vital to be able to access those spaces in your life and in your practice, to be able to um, open yourself to, to be taken beyond, again, what you currently know. And that process will always feel like you are, whether you're comfortable with it or not, it will always feel like you are going out of control. It will always feel like things are becoming a mess and disorientation. As you're moving from one realm of consciousness to another, there will be transformation. There has to be. You know? why, why does a, a caterpillar create a cocoon to become a butterfly? There's a process of needing to protect oneself, right? to go into a space of quiet and stillness and to be hidden. This is a being who can pass through hidden realms. You have to be able to pass through a hidden realm to come out to a different space of consciousness. And we, we are afraid of those hidden realms because in those spaces there's darkness, there's uncertainty. We're removed from what we normally see. You know. So you can take that in. Um, let's look at the next one, Kelly. Oh, no. Uh, it's okay. Go to the Beatles. There you go. Okay. So um, this is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi with the Beatles. Uh, he was the Beatles guru, for those of you that don't know. And um, so this is um, symbolic to me or reminiscent to me of the relational being. So again, the being that comes as a, as a person we can relate to directly. I, I also am so moved by this picture. There's so much openness and joy going on here. and. Um, and of course, it's not just about how they're sort of relating to him, but just the whole energy of how they're all relating to each other. You know, everyone, there's, there's this feeling of, for me, as I look at this, there's this easy circulating energy that's going on with the whole crowd, you know. And, uh, and again, this, this being, this guru who is in the center, if you look at this, he's neither more nor less than anyone else. He's just part of the flow, right, which is a nice teaching in and of itself. Um, so this is that relational space to be able to open up to that, that ease where we're exchanging energy easily and sweetly. Um, okay, so let's look at the, uh, the bust one, the single head. Yeah. Um, so um, this is by an um, 
an artist whose name I'll probably mispronounce, but it's spelled X-I-A-N, the last name. Jean? Jean? Ah, Jean. Um, and uh, he does these beautiful busts in porcelain and other materials. And um, this, to me, is symbolic of that inner guide. Um, and there's, there's something meaningful to me that the, the ordinary relationship of bone and skin has transformed. So as we go into our inner vision, our relationship to our outer body shifts for us. And, um, you know, I also like that it's sort of he's become something of nature. So it's, he's so deep inside that, like, the body has grown into a tree or, you know, other things. He's, he's deep, 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 deep in there. Um, so, and, and, you know, just to, to remember, it's been a while since we said, so the, the inner teacher ultimately is that transcendent state of your own mind, the space where you are no longer there. That is the true inner teacher. Because it is from there, then you're able to relate to all form properly. Um, and let's look at that last one, that horse one. So um, this is a this is a photograph by Donna McAdams, and I just love this photograph a lot. And to me, this relates to um, the guide as as your life and. You know, as a beautiful image, you can sort of ask who's the teacher and who's the student here in this relationship. And uh, this sort of tether of energy. And it's nice if you think of the horse as the teacher, that the student is, you know, is just trying to connect to this amazing, wild, unbridled energy, you know, and is, is holding her own, like just trying to be there. And so, you know, to think less about trying to tame that energy, but how to be connected to that space, you know. Um, and then I also think I, I live in Ohio and there's, there's horses right by us and I always see people riding horses and so this to me is very much like, you know, there's so many teachings just in what we do in our everyday life. Um, getting up, you know, making breakfast for your family or whatever you do, going to your work, calling your brother, etc. Th these are all the teachings. They're all there if we have the eyes to see it, yeah. So. I just wanted to share those with you. Um, so we'll do one last little thing here, and then we'll close up five, five more minutes. Um, so we'll close our eyes. We'll do a short meditation. So getting yourself comfy and taking yourself back into that space where you are by the body of water, you've come out of the darkness, you've followed the path of light, you see the teacher across the body of water, they're emanating that light and they come to you and now you're sitting right across from them. And you're thinking of them quite purely, you're thinking of them as a being who loves you unconditionally and completely a being who has perfect wisdom, great power, and compassion. And you can feel the great kindness that they're offering you. And thinking now for yourself, really entering into the stream of, of that presence, all the ways that you might act in your life, how, how will you meet this being now? Here you're meeting them in your mind's eye and your inner vision. How will you meet them as you get dressed in the morning? How will you meet them as you go through your day? What kind of practices will bring you closer to this being? To this presence, to this consciousness? What practices are you already doing that are helping bring you closer? And 
And so I'm sure you already have many in your mind. So just take a moment now and maybe on the other side of the card that was in your peripheral envelope, just take a minute or two and start another collage and image of practices and actions that you might take. Again, it could be literal or non-literal, an image, a word, a mark on a piece of paper, as long as it's meaningful for you. To sort of set your, your energy stream as you go forward. How do you want to move forward from this day? So just take a minute or two to do that. So, um, again, if this is meaningful for you, you know, take some time when you get home and, and continue this, um, continue working on this. We'll just close uh, with a last um, sort of dedication. And uh, the way we'll dedicate, uh, if there's any, again, with a, a type of incantation speech, if anyone would like to voice an action or if you have an image or a word, whatever it might be from uh, what we just did, that's meaningful for you, for yourself to put into action. You don't need to communicate to us. I don't need to understand you. I may or may not. It might even just be a sound. Um, but we'll just give a few moments here. No one needs to raise their hand if you wish to voice, voice it, and we'll all be able to participate in that stream of action as well then. Focus straight in.
if anyone online wants to write anything, Jed can voice it to the group too. So make solid in yourself that you are here. Make a firm commitment to yourself that whatever was meaningful for you today will stay with you. There's nothing you have to do about that. We're just marking it. That what was meaningful today is moving through you now. And you know in yourself what it is that you wish to do, what you want to do, and know that you have the power to do that, that you have great strength within you to move forward, to continue to move your life in the direction that is meaningful for you. So feel very happy, both that you made it here, but also that everyone else made it here, and that we were able to share this time together without disruption, without sickness, without pain, too much outer pain or inner pain to the point that we couldn't be here. And let us be grateful that we had this day together. And let our gratitude honor all of our teachers, those that have been, those that are now, and those that will be. And may we, with this gratitude, be able to enter their hearts and to have them enter our hearts and to live at peace and enjoy. So thank you for coming. Again, it's meaningful in my life that you're here. I really appreciate you sharing time with me and discussing these things, considering these things. Um, we'll meet again in a month. And, um, and then I think Brian mentioned the resting retreat, which is actually the next, will be the installment after that. If anyone is interested in coming to the retreat and they cannot afford the retreat, you should contact me um, or you can contact Geneva as one of the producers um, and uh, we'll figure it out. No one should not come to the retreat because they can't afford the retreat. Um, the retreat costs money because it's at a place and we have to pay for the facilities and to be fed and stuff. It's not for the teachings, but um, it's, it's meaningful to be together for three days. Um, but, you know, again, please, if anyone has concerns about the money, that's not a reason not to come, and we'll figure that out. Um, and, uh, and then uh, David and I, in a, in a little while, in, in April, starting April 16th on Tuesday nights, um, we're teaching a, a class on embodiment, and we'll be doing all types of um, physical improvisation uh, work and work with the body. So if you, if you like to move and you're interested in working more in your form meditatively, you might come to those classes. And uh, and I'll stay here for a little bit if people have questions, but I don't want to uh, go over more. So if you have questions, feel free to come up and um, have a beautiful night. Thank you for coming. For the retreat, yeah. Thanks, everyone online. Have a lovely night or day, wherever you might be in the world. <laughs> Morning. Or take more than one flyer. Give it to someone that you care about. <laughs> Or someone you don't care about. <laughs> but you would like to care about, which is why you're going to the retreat.